Hi there, everybody. I'm Jeff Mayers from WISPolitics.com and WISBusiness.com here today with our summer edition of the WISPolitics, WISBusiness, Wisconsin Technology Council Trade Policy Virtual Luncheon. And today we're going to focus on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework and what it means for Wisconsin trade. So I want to thank uh, a lot of organizations here that helped make these events possible. This is number three of four this calendar year. Of course, the Wisconsin Technology Council and Tom Still, the president, who's going to be the moderator for this event. Our sponsor, Michael Best Strategies, and our partners. First off, the UW-Madison Center for East Asian Studies. This is uh, part of the East Asian Now series of events. And then also the International Practice Section of the State Bar of Wisconsin, MMAC's World Trade Association, the Wisconsin District Export Council, and the Madison International Trade Association. Also want to give a plug for um, the Talking Trade uh, podcast series, video podcast series that we do through this network uh, that uh, is, is co-hosted by Sandy Siegel of ME Day and Ian Coxhead of UW-Madison. And they recently had a conversation with a top U.S. Commerce Department official on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So I invite you to go to wisbusiness.com and uh, find that video. Um, but today, we're going to have a live discussion with uh, moderated by Tom Still. He's the president of the Wisconsin Technology Council and a very good friend. And so I uh, want to turn things over now to Tom. Thanks very much, Tom. And thank you, panelists. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks to um, our all of your sponsors and in particular to our panelists today. You know, as we thought about why this topic, um, you know, it, it really does strike home in Wisconsin in a lot of ways that probably people don't initially think of. Uh, and uh, Katie Senate, who's one of our panels, can, can drill into this later. But when I looked at Wisconsin's export figures uh, for uh, the countries that are part of the Indo-Pacific Pact, um, about 15% of all trade, all exports in 2021, was tied to one of those countries. So uh, so it's it's well worth talking about today and I'm so glad that people are here. I'm gonna start uh, with some introductions. Katie Sennett, she's Vice President of Global Trade and Investment for the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, otherwise known as WDC. So she's she really helps manage their work on exports, on uh, foreign direct investment, and just generally driver industries in Wisconsin. She's got a lot of experience globally over time, and, and especially in the Pacific Rim. She uh, was in China as a, as a business owner there. She's worked in about 40 different countries. She's been a part of McKinsey and Company in the past, and uh, so some other experiences as well. So welcome, Katie. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. John Onis Onisorg is just with us here today. He's the George Young Baskin Professor of Law at the UW-Madison and Director of the East Asian Legal Studies department within the law school. And he's the former chair of the Wisconsin China Initiative, which was uh, was very active in, as, as trade and other relations were building there. Um, he's chaired the law school's strategic planning to, uh, process in the past. And he spent, you know, he spent some time in East Asia, as all of these panelists have. He was a teacher and a law student in Shanghai in the 1980s, and then a lawyer in private practice in Seoul, South Korea. Later on, he's been a visiting professor or scholar at the Max Planck uh, Institute in Germany and at Harvard's Center for Inter Euro European Studies. So thank you very much, John, for being with us today. Thanks. And uh, last but not least, least Ralph Infrazato. Ralph is the Chief Executive Director of J JETRO Chicago. That's an acronym for the Japan External Trade Organization. And they facilitate trade and investment between Japan and 12 Midwestern states out of the Jetro Chicago office, which, which Ralph runs. Um, you know, over time, he's, he's worked really about three decades around Japan and U.S. trade and, and other economic development. It's a sort of outbound and inbound side of things with technology uh, collaboration, especially. 
and especially with small and medium sized com companies. So that's a good size, you know, a good part of the footprint in Wisconsin. Um, it's, it's, he's been a part of the Japan US Biotechnology Initiative, uh, service robotics, and, and manufacturing sort of philosophies and techniques. So he touches, he's touched on a lot of the strengths in the, in the Wisconsin uh, sort of framework itself. So with that, I'm gonna start with John. Uh, you, you've looked at this, you have a long history of looking at similar kind of agreements involving the Pacific Rim. Tell us briefly, what, what is the Indo-Pacific Economic free Framework? And it has a longer net name that includes prosperity. And what is it not? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Um, it is not a traditional, uh, what we think of as a traditional trade agreement um, in which countries get together and, and uh, bargain out binding commitments over things like tariff rates, non-tariff barriers, um, subsidies, quotas, uh, intellectual property rights, dispute. Those usually have a dispute resolution mechanism. Um, it is not one of those. If, if the Biden administration had wanted to do one of those, they would have worked with Congress to get what's called trade promotion authority from Congress because the constitution assigns regulation of foreign trade to Congress. Congress over the years has delegated that to the presidents for obvious reasons. Congress can't, that's not a good vehicle for negotiating trade agreements. So the executive branch gets the lead normally, but they get it under this kind of trade promotion authority status that Congress gives to the executive branch. And the Biden administration has been, they've expressed skepticism, at least for now, about traditional trade agreements like NAFTA um, or the, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which, which um, we're, we're not part of. Um, so I don't think they asked for, for uh, trade promotion authority. They don't have it. Um, so what this is, it looks like, is a, an attempt to put together a forum for discussions um, around trade issues and that could lead to uh, sort of binding commitments at some point. Um, but it looks like actually they've, they've actually backed off a little bit in their description. So, which I found very interesting. They're, what they're now saying is that the announcement from Tokyo on the 23rd, we launch collective discussions toward future negotiations. So we're gonna have discussions about future negotiations and then those negotiations will be around these four pillars that they've identified. But it, so they've actually backed off from saying exactly what's in the, gonna be in the four pillars. And it looks like that itself is gonna be uh, open for discussion among the, the parties, which is, which is interesting. I think it's, it's a, it was a good move to, to make it even less kind of um, defined by the US from day one. Mm -hmm. And was the U.S. trade representative involved, to your knowledge, as as this framework was being discussed? Uh, for sure. And I, I defer to, to Ralph and Katie on on who's who's playing in Washington. It's a little it's a little bit unclear to me, but but certainly, I mean, the, the USTR and Commerce are the lead um, are the lead uh, parts of government on this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think we should talk a little bit about actually who's a part of it, obviously the U United States, but uh, Japan, Australia, South, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, New Zealand and Brunei. So, I mean, it's a it's a big group um, and, and you got to start somewhere. Right. I mean, as you, you said, maybe it was a smart move for the administration to not define so much at the top but leave it open for discussion. That's a very interesting, uh, that's a very interesting issue is, is who's in it. Um, if you compare it to like APEC or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which are two other bodies or groups or agreements, um, there's nobody in this one from Latin America or Central America. So and and Chile, countries like Chile, Mexico, Peru are in those other organizations because, of course, they're part of the Pacific too, um, mm -hmm. as much as we are. Um, and they're not in this uh, now. It looks like they'd be free to join if they were interested, um, but they're not in it right now. Um, bringing India in is 
is interesting. India has this uh, kind of, you know, they're, they have a very complicated attitude toward, let's say, economic liberalization, engagement with the global economy, things like that. So it's important to have India in, I think, for strategic purposes, if you see this as kind of a counterbalance to China in some way. But bringing India in may make it more complicated to actually negotiate binding commitments. Um, but we'll just have to see. Um, and uh, to this point, Taiwan is not in. Early on, there were questions about that. There, I think some countries in ASEAN particularly expressed some concern about inviting Taiwan in, in the sense that that would alienate the People's Republic. Um, the, so Taiwan is not in. The latest I've seen is that the Biden administration is perhaps going to be talking to Taiwan bilaterally about the same issues. So sort of have a parallel bilateral thing going on with Taiwan that would cover the same issues that are going to be discussed in this in this uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And, and we'll talk a little more later about China and why this may be a counterbalance there. Let me turn to Katie. Um, Katie, you you heard me talk a little bit about some of the the countries that that are in, and um, how they. I mean, you know your trade rankings, how that how that stacks up. Um, what do you think this means for Wisconsin as as we move ahead? Is it going to open some doors that were previously not, if not shut, maybe hard to open? So, Katie, take it away. Sure. Thanks. So although, as um, John mentioned, this is not a trade agreement, I still feel like it will offer opportunities for Wisconsin companies as that focus on the Indo-Pacific will increase and the discussion with our federal government will likely open doors for us, which you rightly mentioned are sometimes hard to open. So in Wisconsin, we focus on particular driver industries like advanced manufacturing, water technology, food and beverage, biohealth, renewable energy, et cetera. So we look at that both in terms of foreign direct investment, which both Ralph and I are actually doing today. We're yeah. all in Select USA working to attract foreign direct investment um, for Wisconsin. Japan is our largest source. So it's likely that these 13 nations will provide us an opportunity to um, get closer to them. And as we coalesce around those four pillars, in particular, the fourth pillar, which is a fair economy, that's something that the United States brings up frequently and we sometimes struggle with um, in some of those countries. So that, that's a real plus in terms of trade and foreign direct investment. Um, when we look at the actual trade with um, those 13 potential member companies, uh, we export 1.8 billion to those 13 countries. Our total trade for 2021 was 24.8 billion. So we do have an opportunity to grow. Um, I think some of the, the areas that are pretty exciting with the pillar around the connected economy. So Asia has a really large and fast growing e-commerce marketplace in all of those countries. And their domestic consumption is really driving you know, it's a driving factor in their economic growth. So we're hoping to see opportunities for our companies in the e-commerce marketplace. For example, Gartner estimates within the, you know, next five years, 75% of B2B procurement spending will be done online. And B2B online marketplaces will account for 40% of global online retail market. So that's incredible. We've worked a lot with Wisconsin companies during COVID to get them up to speed to work online to do sales B2B in the e-commerce environment. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, our farmers are also very excited. Um, obviously, as these countries demand more protein, high quality produce and added value food and ag products, we'll be right there to step up. Tom? Yeah. That's great. And, you know, the the growth and overall export value from Wisconsin, as you noted, is twenty four point eight billion in twenty twenty one. That was up significantly from the twenty point five billion in twenty twenty. Now, I'm sure COVID had a hand in maybe not allowing that growth to take place as it did. But do you think some of the e-commerce pieces that you've tried to stress, is that part of the 
pretty significant growth in the last year on exports? I think that is part of the growth. We've seen um, many of our companies who maybe didn't have a presence on any e-commerce platforms really move to that, particularly in the food industry where uh, a lot of food sales, uh, instead of going to maybe restaurants or large distributors, were going to the individual. Yeah, very good. Well, let me turn to Ralph, Ralph and Frizzato. And I should have mentioned earlier, obviously both you and Ralph are at the Select USA uh, conference in DC. And uh, so thank you for joining us live from there. Ralph and Frizzato, you have had a lot of experience in Japan, Midwest, and in particular, Wisconsin, sort of trade matters, but beyond, you know, with the whole economy. As I was looking at 2021 export value figures for Japan alone, that was nearly $700 million. And so there's a, a long history of that. But Ralph, tell us a little more about your thoughts and how this could directly help in Wisconsin and the rest of the 12 states that you help serve. Thanks, Tom. Um, I am Ralph Infrazato. My comments are my opinions and they don't reflect the policies of the Japan External Trade Organization. Let me say that. Let me give you some context here. We're in Washington with Katie and I, I've talked to a lot of people about this. They're calling this IPEF, I-P-E-F. But when you read the documents from President Biden and Secretary of Commerce Raimondo, it's called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. You know why they did that? Because. Be because they're bureaucrats and like acronyms? Because, no, it's more important than that. The TPP, the Trans-Pacific Economic Partnership was extremely robust and powerful but it never could articulate its value to the American people and to the American workers. So, so Secretary of State Anthony Blinken got that. And you have to read this. On March 3rd, 2021, he wrote an amazing vision of American foreign policy for the American people. Within that March 3rd speech, he said, any trade framework, any multilateral agreement, any trade agreement, we have to explain and articulate its value to the American people, to American workers, and of course, to the American business community. So they got the narrative right, right? It's a, they went from a TPP technical to a very clear and articulate, we have to show how this agreement or this framework Will benefit the American people. They got the narrative right. Now, I think any time the President of the United States uses his focus and commitment to shine energy on the economic dynamics of the Indo-Pacific or the Asia-Pacific, it's a huge victory for the United States in the region. Tom, John, we've been absent from this area since President Trump pressed the delete button on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So this immediately gets us back into the region as a framework, not as a trade agreement, but the perception is it may lead to a trade negotiation. So the color of truth here is gray, but that's good enough for the Biden administration. They're bringing us back into the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific. It's a very good thing. They have to do this because the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive uh, Trade Pacific Partnership, they're expanding and this agreement is moving forward. Listen to this. The United Kingdom is already in the process of no negotiation into the CPTPP. South Korea is preparing their application and China, Taipei, and Ecuador, they are interested in applying. So the Biden administration has to move quickly. And they worked very hard to come up with this Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. It's very good. Not a trade agreement, it's a framework, but it's perceived, as John said, as leading to trade negotiations. Now, those four pillars that Katie was talking about, extremely flexible. The signatories 
can join a single pillar, they can join two, they can join three or all four. So it's very flexible. Now, I want to explain to you, we're in Washington and I'm talking to people about this. How does this benefit the, the apex automations of Bob Gross over in Milwaukee, for example? And they said that the administration is going to really focus on this Indo-Pacific Asia Pacific, if you will, too, area for United States trade policy development. For example, the US Department of Commerce's huge trade wins programs, which supports business partnering for small and medium sized companies, their first physical event will be March 12th through 15th in Bangkok, Thailand, right? So the Wisconsin small and medium sized companies. Katie was describing it like clean environment, agriculture. They can participate and meet business partners, not only from Thailand, but from the ASEAN nation. So guess what? First in line is, right, ASEAN, Thailand, a member of the framework, the, the IPEF. So these large scale framework agreements, they do have an impact in the micro policies that will really help are small and medium-sized companies. Now they're gonna to go to Thailand. I have some other things to say later, but those are my initial comments. Thank you. Okay, very good. And let's, um, let's go back to the notion, I mean, we've kind of talked around this a little bit, but China, uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. When President Trump did hit the delete button on the Trans-Pacific Pact, um, China, people in China probably saw that as an opportunity to expand influence uh, in the Pacific Rim. And um, at, at this point, you know, that has certainly happened. Um, but how does this, how will this potentially counter some of China's economic re, uh, presence in the region? What does it mean for, if anything, for larger security reasons, such as tensions with Taiwan? So John, let me, let me start with you on that. Well, I, I think, um, yeah, I think the, the main way that China stepped into the vacuum was was through the RECEP, mm -hmm. um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership uh, mm -hmm. group that they've spearheaded. Um, and that was actually, it, they, it, it, it formally took, uh, took shape um, January 1st of this year. So it was in discussion for a long time and there were negotiations and things, but they they finally formalized the creation of RECEP. And the interesting thing is um, most of the countries that are in this, in the IPEF group are already in RECEP. Um, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Australia, ASEAN, I think much of ASEAN is in and, and the PRC. Um, so, uh, it's very interesting that you know if you if you have a group of countries that are all trying to pursue the same development policy which is that everybody's trying to export everybody's sort of mercantilist right everybody's trying to export more than they import so they want to protect but they want to export to the other to the other countries i mean to me that's kind of what recep is because that's still china's policy and and um so I just think there are real limits to what that can do. On the other hand, if we if we want um, IPEF to develop into something that would be a uh, like a another one of these organizations, so there's the TP the the, the CPTPP exists, RECEP exists, APEC exists. If, as Ralph was saying, if IPEF is going to is going to be a platform that could develop into some kind of a set of binding obligations and a trade agreement, um, that would be a fourth thing. Um, and uh, you know, if if we want that, I think we will have to make we will have to agree to to um, some kind of market access uh obligations on our part to to get the other countries especially the the lower income countries interested in really giving up things on their side so this this has been one of the criticisms of this from the beginning uh which is like well what's the u.s giving up it looks like the u.s is going to have a bunch of asks 
it looks like the Biden administration is is reluctant to commit to any market opening on our on our behalf. So who's why would other countries really really want to give up anything to be part of this? Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Ralph and and Katie probably have more insights on that than I do. Um, but um, but it's interesting. And so so Recep, I think I think Recep only exists because we pulled out of the TPP. Frankly, I don't you know. Mm -hmm. That's my personal view, and I, I, it's, I think the, the I, I agree with Ralph. The TPP wasn't marketed well, but also partly a branding, a branding problem. You know, branding's important, but also just the politics of that year with with Bernie Sanders running from further left against Hillary, and uh, you know, I, I think if Hillary had been elected she would have found a way to reverse her reversal and actually bring us into the TPP. Maybe they would have renamed it, rebranded it or something, the TPP for prosperity or something. But I think she would have, as president, she would have brought us into it. Uh, but that's that's water uh, under the bridge. Well, let's um, let's get back to for a second, you know, some of those areas, Katie, that you discussed, some of the you know key sectors in the Wisconsin economy. I um, mean, you know, obviously there are different sleeves in in farming, uh, biomedical, uh, increasingly uh, uh, just tech. You know, in terms of IT and some of the, com the companies that are here, uh, the notion of energy, and 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 all of this adds up to maybe having a more resilient economy overall. But talk specifically about, and, and Ralph as well, specifically about those sectors, about how you think they might benefit with better trade relations, more exports, more imports, if, if that's part of it too, with those, uh, with those countries and foreign direct investment. Let's get a little granular with each sector, if we may. Sure. On the trade side, um we always promote in Wisconsin at the WDC trade diversification and your mm -hmm. ability to sell to more than one market. And in Wisconsin, the average company only sells to one to three separate markets around the world. So part of what I would hope would come through this and other trade agreements is diversification in our export efforts. Um, and also in our imports. So mm -hmm. if you just a note about China, in 2021 and for years back, China has been Wisconsin's top import source as it has been for many um, locations, geographies around the world. We most recently imported 7.5 billion worth of goods. Um, and they are also our third largest export destination, mm -hmm. uh, but we are only exporting 1.8 billion to China. So there's a significant imbalance there. Um, what we're hoping is that our companies will have more opportunity, particularly in those larger countries. If you think about India and Indonesia, India has 1.4 billion people. Indonesia has 274 million people together. That's you know 1.7 billion people that we could export into better. India is our 16th trading partner, and Indonesia is um, quite a bit lower than that at um, 20th. So we have an opportunity there to grow across the the four top um, industry sectors, which are machinery, medical and scientific instruments, mm -hmm. and electrical machinery. So that's that's a real opportunity for us. In Among those 13 countries, only four of them, Japan being the first, are really where all of our exports go. So there's a hope that barriers will be reduced. There will be more transparency in the trade so that our companies won't be as concerned about possibilities of not getting paid or having their product uh, not land as it should. Mm -hmm. uh, on FDI, we certainly will be focusing on those countries to attract across those driver industries that I mentioned before. And in fact, we talked to people from many of those countries while we were here at Select USA. Excellent. And uh, yeah, and you you touched base on well, medical equipment, electrical equipment. Those are, those are key areas in Wisconsin. And so mm -hmm. some opportunities there. Um, Ralph. 
you know, I think about Kikamon being one of the early examples of, of Japanese investment and, and major presence in Wisconsin. Can you talk about that a little more about some of the other things you've seen from your perspective and, and what it might mean in terms of Japan and Wisconsin in particular, and especially in those sectors we, we outlined? Well, Kikoman Corporation is the first Japanese investor in the United States after the war. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you would think they would be in California, right? But mm -hmm. they came to Delavan, Wisconsin. I mean, it's 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 a it's a a shining star of the of the nature of investment from Japan. So I just wanted to make some comments though from Katie. You and, and John, regarding the, the framework, John said quite rightly that in negotiations, the United States wants a country to do labor reform or enhancing the environment. In return, we're gonna give a market access, lower our tariffs to the US market. Everybody wants access to the US market, right? Mm -hmm. But in IPEF, the market access dynamic is not there. However, I think that a lot of the countries have to engage in clean energy, clean water, clean technology, infrastructure building. And the United States can dangle that and say, we will have American companies and we will support American companies coming into your country to engage in enhancing clean air, for example. All right, That's yeah. the, that takes that substitutes for the market access. That would, have to, that would have to be part of the dynamic in order to get the signatories to move. That's what I think. I also wanna talk about China a bit. China's an incredibly dominant economic power in Asia and the world. And the countries in IPEF, they depend upon trade with China. I was just looking at some data 26% of all Japanese exports in 2021 were to China, okay? Korea, South Korea, which is an IPEF, 31% of their total exports was were to China. And Taiwan, which is not part of IPEF, and you, you hear a lot of the tension around the Taiwan-China relationship, but in fact, 42% of Taiwan's exports go to China. Hmm. So China is an incredibly important market for the our country, the United States. Only about nine percent of our exports go to China. So I, I, you know, where you sit determines what you see. So from from the Indo-Pacific countries, they have China on their mind, and they need those markets. So they have to be in this kind of balancing mechanism on on joining the Indo-Pacific economic framework, but they also have, I'm gonna use the term, money in the bank with dealing with the Chinese market town. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ralph. Let's get back to the notion of who's not in, and this can be for everybody. You know, the top three trade partners in terms of exports with Wisconsin are Canada, Mexico, and China, right? And so they all have, they're all Pacific Rim, you know, I mean, that's the, the core geography of it. How does this work without all three of those in? And some of the ones that are in South America, some of the nations in South America as well. Is it, it will it ultimately be a success only if some of those other players are in? Ralph, I'll start with you because you were just talking. Okay. About it. Yeah. You know, in my experience, if we're at the table, the negotiating table, if you want to call it a poker table, Canada is always watching. Canada <laughs> will wait until they can get all the information they need, and then they'll decide whether to participate or not. Right now, right now, I think Canada's in a great position because they're in the CPTPP, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't need to move, I think, until they can find out how the U.S. pushes these four pillars. Okay. Well, and uh, did you mention Taiwan? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, and, and by extension, obviously Taiwan. Yes. So Taiwan is not a member, I think, because countries like Indonesia, they have such a good relationship with China. They feel that 
if the if Taiwan's a member, China may look in a negative way at them. But at some point, you have to consider Taiwan. It'll be interesting to see how the Biden administration proceeds. But here in Washington, there's talk about a U.S.-Taiwan economic framework or agreement. So that we were dealing with that. Um, and as you said, I think somebody said there's nobody from South America involved. That, yeah. has, to, that has to take into consideration too. Thank you. Right, thank you. And by the way, for our listeners, uh, if you've got questions or comments, um, go, to, go to the chat room and, and get those in. Now, let me turn to Katie. Katie, you spent a lot of years in China. I mean, you were running a successful business there. Uh, and back to you with that same core question is, can this really work in the long term unless China, Taiwan, Canada, Mexico are all in? I think it will be complex to have them all in. Um, that will be very difficult to bring the Taiwan and China in as they stand today. Um, also, a lot of the members of the CPTPP, as Ralph mentioned, are probably watching. This is a relatively new discussion. A lot of things remain undefined. So they're probably waiting to see what the United States can negotiate with those potential 13 countries to see what their involvement is. And there probably is a certain amount of heartburn because of the reliance on China for trade for some mm -hmm. of the potential uh, members and economies that aren't involved. Um, so I think there's a lot of wait and see attitude. Mm -hmm. and it sounds like Canada is the guy at the poker table who's always wearing the sunglasses so nobody can see his eyes. <laughs> so yeah, okay. John, same question. What will it take? And you initially raised the South America um, question as well. Yeah, I would. I would think. Um, well, I don't know. I, I honestly, I don't know. What What I thought was the most interesting thing, and this is pretty encouraging, about membership was initially um, Thailand and the Philippines were not on the list, and that just seemed to me really odd. I don't know. I don't know what the selection criteria were that the Biden administration. Uh, was was following when they initially invited people to join. Um, but those are two really important countries. And it, to have this without without Thailand and without the Philippines um, just seemed seemed really unfortunate. And that's been corrected. So it looks like, you know, people it looks like this this got off to kind of a rough start, but it's thing this the administration seems to be learning and, and things are improving. Um, Interestingly, there were no none of the Pacific Island nations were members initially, and if you look at this from a strategic point of view, that's a real problem. China is very active in in the in Pacific Islands, trying to build allies and you know, potentially having naval bases and all sorts of things that we sh we should be thinking about from a strategic point of view. I see now that Fiji is is in, which is good. I think. Um, you know, I maybe maybe it's not the job for commerce and USTR to be thinking about about military strategy, but it should be somebody's job, and they should be saying, why don't we why don't we try to pull in more more of the Pacific Island nations um, other than other than Australia and New Zealand. Um, so I think that's good. That's really good. Um, whether you know, um, I guess. I, yeah, because so many of the Latin America or the, the Pacific Rim countries in Latin and Central America are already part of APAC and and the CPTPP, I guess, yeah, they don't need this as much until the, and they can afford to wait a while to see to see what added value this really brings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's a long history of how naval power and how it's positioned in the Pacific Rim has made or break some things. So we all know that, that's for sure. So an audience question, and I think it's right on point kind of from where we're at. If the Indo-Pacific Pact would develop into something more concrete, is there any hope that it will not run into the same political opposition that killed the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership? So could, we, could, could this be a setup for the same political problems that took that down? John? I'll start there and we'll go, go go to the others as well. 
Uh, well, I think I think the Biden administration, I mean, I think that's why they set this up the way they did and initially mm -hmm. saying we're not going to be making any market access concessions. Um, obviously, as we've talked about that as a starting point for negotiations, that's, that's you sort of you've got one arm tied behind your back, but I think they did that to avoid political opposition. And as, as Ralph was saying, that was really interesting. So, you know, on the clean energy pillar, if we just asked countries to shut down their coal fired power plants, they would say, no, what are you going to give us in exchange? And we'd have to give them some real serious something or other to get them to shut down coal fired power plants. And that's off the table. So if so, the other way to get the economies to be cleaner is to help our companies export clean energy technology to those countries. That that's a great one. All 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 it requires is taxpayer dollars to be put toward you know export financing or 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 uh, things like that. So um, so that's really interesting. And and um, well, I guess I'll just I'll just stop there. I don't you know sure. okay. turn it over to Ralph and Katie. Yeah, Ralph, uh, the same question to you. Um, would, um, is there any chance that this will not run into the same kind of political opposition that, that TPP encountered? Uh, I think from earlier comments, you perhaps uh, uh, agree a little bit with John on this. I would say it will not because the Biden people, they've captured the narrative on making sure that the Americans knows that we will win, you know? Mm -hmm. In past negotiation, it was a give and take. We gave and the other signatories took. Mm -hmm. The Biden people got it right. They know that they have to show that how we're winning. I'm sure once the negotiations develop, you're gonna see case studies of success, right? They're gonna show case studies of success on how a uh, Wisconsin or an Illinois company benefit from participating in IPAP. So just to carry on the conversations from John, right? US Export Import Bank financing, clean technology, infrastructure development in Indonesia. And what does Indonesia get? They get movement toward clean, clean mm -hmm. environment. And the US gets a big pat on the back because we're contributing to a clean environment. That's how the incentive may work. It's not a trade negotiation, but it's more of an infrastructure play as, as John articulated. I think that's how it will come. Um, remember, USMCA, that passed with great bipartisan support. There's some precedent mm -hmm. here. And I was talking here in Washington, who's supporting IPEF anyway? And actually, um, they're getting support from Congress um, the Congress, they want them to go farther and deeper. They want to go to negotiations now, actually. So, Tom, maybe we have turned the corner on the hideous discussions on trade policy that took us out of TPP. Um, you may not agree with President Trump, or you may agree with him, but he brought the discussions of trade policy to the dinner table every night. Mm -hmm. And I think the Biden people learn their lessons. And so they have to create a win-win situation for everybody here. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. And you make an excellent point, Ralph, that the U.S.-Canada-Mexico uh, agreement, I think I have that order correct, was passed with a fair amount of bipartisan support. I mean, and, and it was a it's, of course, a successor to NAFTA. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's an excellent point. Let me get to Katie a little bit on this. Um, so, Ralph is saying that, you know, that the, the Biden administration got the narrative right. They have done some things at the front end of this discussion so that Americans aren't, aren't sort of automatically turned off. And, <laughs> and that, that's important. And, and also the note that if we are able, and I say this as a state, and this is something we will try to watch very closely, as you know, at the Tech Council, clean energy technologies, clean water technologies, both of which we have uh, quite a bit of expertise on, not, not only just in industry, but in our academic institutions. Is, is that going to kind of contribute to what Ralph was talking about in terms of not only feel good, but actual tangible results in some of these countries? Katie. Great. Thank you. 
So I agree with Ralph that the communication strategy and the creation of those pillars has been very smart and very well done because not only does it say, so if you want a resilient economy, that's not only saying in other countries, but it's also communicating back what we would like to have in our own country without forcing it upon people. So I think one of the things that will also, I'd like to focus on, I'll touch on the clean economy, economy because that's incredibly important to Wisconsin with the Office of Sustainability and the first clean energy plan for the state. And we have many, many companies in that area that will be exporting and supporting other um, geographies with that technology, but also things like um, mapping critical mineral supply chain. Mm -hmm. We need to have that. We need to have, they're also talking about traceability in key sectors, early warning systems for supply chain problems. All of that will really speak to a Wisconsin company who has gone through COVID, who has faced those critical supply chain problems. So I think um, the communication has been very different from TPP. So I see perhaps as Ralph said, we, we have turned the corner on that um, discussion and that these topics with the connected economy, resilient economy, clean economy, fair economy, another thing that's critical to our companies um, that will resonate. Very good. Well, you, you just mentioned supply chain. Obviously we've all heard about the various and sundry problems there, especially since COVID, but it's not all COVID. I mean, some of it's just, you know, consumer demand, especially in this country. And, and but, you know, one relate, somewhat related piece or at least potentially related that the past was the Ocean Shipping Reform Act and actually, Senator Baldwin from Wisconsin had a had a lead role in that. Um, I just want to open it up to all three of you about what you know about that act, and do you think the that this that it will help in some ways as we go down the path of talking about the Indo-Pacific uh, Pact? So, then Katie, I'm, we might as well start with you on this. Sure, I, th I think they're pretty related. The act is um, expected to ease shipping backlogs, add transpar transparency to ocean carrier operations and help manufacturers and farmers in Wisconsin get their products to market at a fair price. All of that's good news. Um, as you know, delays at the US ports contributed to supply chain issues over the past two years. You know, in addition, you know, we had such high carrier costs from ocean carriers. For example, I'm sure many on this call are familiar with that in the depths of COVID container costs increased from about two to 3,000 per container to a high of 30,000, if you could even find a container. So if successful, I think that the Ocean Shipping Reform Act will improve bilateral trade flows, which should be in line with the IPEF. Very good. Um, let me turn to, to, to John on that. I don't, uh, have you had an opportunity to, to study that, that act a little bit? And what do you think about its impact, especially in, in terms of this, the Indo Pacific Pact? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really on the ground uh, talking to business people in Wisconsin about their problems with exporting, you know, the way that Katie was. So I, I am a little skeptical about, about this. It, it could turn out to be an example of regulation designed to fight yesterday's war and, and regulation never goes away. I teach administrative law, it's one of my courses. So it's all about federal regulatory agencies. We start with the Interstate Commerce Commission, you know, which was set up to regulate railroads back in the 19th century. Um, so and and so once you do something like this, it never seems to go away. You know, we we rarely deregulate an, an industry that we've regulated. Um, mm -hmm. Although we did deregulate, we, we got rid of the Interstate Commerce Commission finally, and we we deregulated airlines. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, so that's my skepticism, I guess. You know, and I and also I don't I, I I'm one of the people that thinks our inflation problems are caused mostly by monetary policy rather than supply chain problems. So if, so if this is an, if, if this is being sold as a way to uh, combat inflation, I think it's, I think that's, that's, it's not the best way to combat inflation. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm a little bit skeptical about it. On the other hand, you know, the the, the contracts are, I, I did a little bit of maritime law back in the day when I was a lawyer in Seoul. And the, the web of contracts between shippers and carriers and freight forwarders and port operators, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of room in there for the contracting to shift risk. I mean, that's basically what they do. They're all trying to shift risk around from the shippers to the carriers to somebody else. You know, um, so that cuts both ways. It's, it's, it's possible that those contracts are are sort of systematically unfair in some way, but you'd have to define what fair means. Um, and then do you really want a government bureaucracy deciding what the terms should be of, of commercial contracts between shippers and carriers? And, and, and so, so those are my concerns about it. Um, yeah. But I really don't, I don't have a good handle on what yeah. this is gonna mean. Yeah, uh, so uh, I mean, you, you seem to be saying that perhaps the shipping industries and it's shipping industry and people on both ends of that probably would work this out over time themselves. Well, that's right. That's the, yeah, that's the market, market you have regulation, right? Those are the, I mean, they, they've been working this stuff out for a couple hundred years. I mean, you exactly. in law school, we teach these old cases in contract law or cases about shipping cotton from India and the cargo, you know, the ship goes down and who's responsible for it. I mean, so the, it's it's an intense world of of essentially private contracting that's built up over a couple hundred years. That even the terminology demurrage, you know, it's, where did that word come from? What does demurrage even mean? Mm. Um, so, you know, empowering the Federal Maritime Commission to come in and like decide what's fair or not in that intensely contracted world is it's. It'll be an interesting thing to observe. You know, it could it could yeah. go different ways. I don't. I have no prediction. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. By the way, the railroad industry is more or less the same, right? I mean, a lot of complicated terms that right. You're not even sure where they came from, but but it's very contract uh, driven. Yeah. yeah. So uh, a question we just got: uh, Will the Biden administration lift the China tariffs, and how would that affect the new framework, uh, John? Got the camera on you right now. Let's start with that, uh, with you on that, and see what you think. And then I want to hear what the others believe. Oh, well, of the three panelists, I'm probably the furthest away from DC and and the politics of of DC and all that. I mean, I it seems like the issue are. I mean, it's a cost benefit thing for the Biden administration. You know, it might help a little bit with inflation to uh, to lift those tariffs, and it might help production in the US for Amer you know a lot of a lot of manufacturers here import steel and other parts that they use in manufacturing so it might it might help our economy really on both those fronts on the other hand it seems like nobody wants to be seen as being a friend of china at this point it's sort of toxic um, politically so i that's just how i kind of understand the, the issues i have no prediction on what's going to happen mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right well let's go to our two uh panels who happen to be in Washington, not that they're at the White House at this very moment, but yeah, Wait, what do you we think? We haven't discussed it with President Biden. Right yeah, yet. you haven't had a chance yet. Yeah. But <laughs> later today, me. maybe. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I'll hop in and then pass it off to Ralph because he sure. would have a different perspective. What we've seen on the China tariffs is that they aren't going to be loosened anytime soon. That's the impression that I have. I think John's right probably that no one wants to be seen as easy on China. Not that that's easy on China because those tariffs are also impacting our companies directly with the, the goods that they're importing and exporting. Um, the only impact that I could see, I'm not sure if it would impact the actual um, agreement that we're talking about is that currently to circumvent those tariffs, products are moving through different countries. Some of those countries that we're talking about that are in that agreement, that could have an, uh, an impact on those countries if those tariffs are lifted. Yeah, very good. Ralph, your thoughts? You know. Also from Washington. <laughs> well, Tom, we the China competition bill should have been done last year. I don't know why that has not been done. Um, they, they talk about the... Mm -hmm intergovernmental process. The intergovernmental process is a way to get consensus 
to formulate a good, strong consensus on policy for China that can be presented to the president. But it's it's been bogged down in the process for the last 18 months, as far as I'm concerned. We have to have this competition bill with China. We have to recalibrate our relationship with our international economic policy with China. I'll say it again. We have to recalibrate our economic policy with China to include a more comprehensive overview of high tech exports, mm -hmm. inward and outward investment screening, finance, intellectual property, R&D collaboration and travel. I mean, those are the pillars that we have to work on. We, I just really strongly feel we have to have a very good, not a good, but a very respectful relationship with China. We cannot, we cannot delink actually, we cannot delink from the economy of China. Mm -hmm. but as far as I can see, there's been no movement toward addressing these pillars with China. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and, I, and you make an excellent point, Ralph. I, you know, the notion of delinking with China was addressed by a previous panel in this series. And the answer out of that was, much as you just said, it's just not really possible, it, it not, not today. Well, I'm gonna close with a kind of a philosophical question or thought for all of you to comment on quickly before we need to close out at the top of the hour. It seems to me that over time, throughout history, actually, when trade works well, companies or countries are linked, countries that might have otherwise poor relations or unstable relations. And when it doesn't work that well, that's when you can, you can begin to see the seeds of conflict on a, on a larger stage. What, uh, Ralph, let's start with you on that. Do you, do you agree or disagree with that notion? I, my philosophy is that we have to have very good trade and investment relationships with globally. We don't have to be friends with the people that we have trade and investment with, but we have to have a relationship with them, all right? And we have to be very analytical on this. Um, somebody said to me that, Somebody said to me that we should just have relationships with our fellow democracies in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't, I agree with that, but we, we have to have, the United States has to have relationships with everybody, right? We don't have to have friendships. We have to have some type of trade and investment relationships. That's what I want to say. Excellent. Thank you. Well, if it's just democracy, it'd be a much smaller party, wouldn't it, Ralph? <laughs> so... Um, Katie, let me move to you on that on that question again. You know, the the function of trade and how it can help in terms of global stability. Well, we can see how um, having the relationships interrupted can have a significant impact on the trade and the prosperity of our economies. We can see what has happened with Ukraine and Russia and the export of grains out of Ukraine and parts of Africa, African countries are suffering because they can't receive that grain. So I agree that we need to remain connected. And foreign direct investment is another great way to do that. When we have those companies here in our country, they feel a relationship with the country, just as we do when we have companies in other countries around the world. It builds not necessarily friends, but at least we have a uh, combined or uh, a single purpose, so. Mm -hmm. Very good. John. And, uh, yeah, thanks. I, go one, ahead. Of the interesting, one of the interesting things going on now is the, is in some ways the, the question of whether there's going to be, we're going to return to a world where there were sort of two trading blocks, the old, mm -hmm. you know, what hasn't existed for a long time, but in the Cold War, there was a socialist block and there was the sort of Western block. And, you know, that's one reason to keep engaged with China is that there, there is not going to be an alternative block unless China's leading. Yeah. Russia can't lead it, um, you know. Um, but, but for things like payment systems, SWIFT, is there going to be a, an, a Chinese alternative to the SWIFT system for, for credit card payments? Is there going to be, is the renminbi going to be an alternative international currency? If it came to that, 
I think that'd be really bad for global prosperity and it, a real step backwards. So I think, and the only way it'll come to that is if, if China is really excluded in some way and they feel that they're excluded. Um, so I, I think that'd be really bad. I think, I think we need to keep engaging um, with China, or at least when we can, as Ralph says, engage in intelligently and at levels we can, but economic engagement, I think, is, is key. And we're not going to, as he's, as Ralph also said, our, the people we're trying to get into this new agreement are all heavily dependent on China. They're all intertwined with China. Um, so uh, so I, I, I think, um, well, I, I'm hopeful that we're in we're in a rough patch, but we're gonna we're gonna come out of it. Um, so I'll leave it yeah. at that. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, prosperity for all sides of the equation depends on on uh, that getting out of that rough patch. Well, I want to thank all three of our panelists as we reach the top of the hour, and our our listeners and and viewers here today. Uh, thanks again to Jeff Mayers and Wiz Business. Dot com and and uh, all of his team there uh, to Katie Senate with uh, WDC where she really heads up the trade uh, efforts there uh, to John Onisorg from the UW Madison Law School and the East Asian Legal Studies uh, team there and to Ralph Infrazato, a longtime friend of of Wisconsin through his role at Jetro the Japan External Trade Organization where he leads the Chicago office and really is in touch throughout the, uh, the Midwest. So thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will definitely see you next time. As Jeff Mayer said at the outset, there'll be a fourth such discussion later this year. And again, thanks to all the, uh, the partners. Michael Best Strategies uh, leads that. We appreciate it. So we'll see, see you all soon. <laughs>